Okay, welcome everyone to the Sea of Masef at Megillah. We're very excited to be here together to celebrate as we get every month another another uh, um celebration. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. We have a bunch of special sponsors. Sea of at Megillah is sponsored by Sharon Goldberg in loving memory of her father. Yechez Kalbein Yerachmi on the occasion of his 11th year at sight. He was a kind and gentle man, a devoted son and brother, and a wonderful father and grandfather. Yehizeh Huro Baruch. Siyum is also sponsored by Rina and Sachi Goldberg in loving memory of Chaim Shalom Ben Aharon Mendel Kurtz on his 46th year at on the 26th of Shvat, and to Penina by Yechezkel Goldberg on her 13th year at on the 21st of Adar. She shares a year at with the ancestor, with her ancestor, the Noam Elimelech. And it's also sponsored by Sharon Russ and family in memory of her mother, Sima Bat Estrella, who just had her shloshi. My mother was taken from us suddenly and tragically. She was born in the old city of Jerusalem in 1942. She faced many challenges in her life, including her visual disability from birth, and persevered with profound faith, strength, and determination. Although she wasn't given the opportunity to study past the eighth grade, she was extremely wise and all gravitated to her to get advice, love, and support. She was totally devoted to her family, giving unconditional love. As kids, we called her the drill sergeant. She was adventurous and full of life and spread joy and happiness to all. She touched the lives of so many and will be sorely missed. May her neshama have an aliyah. And one last minute dedication by Emma and Richard Rimberg for refuash lema to their beloved daughter Rachel, Rachel Ophira Bat Nechama Leah Esther. And I, we can't go on without talking about how our hearts are with the Jews in Colleyville, Texas, what happened yesterday and, and their families, and also with the, the soldiers that were involved in the incident, unfortunately, those who were also murdered, uh, sorry, not murdered, killed by accident, by a tragic incident last week in Israel. And it's hard to have a celebration without mentioning those uh, difficult things that are going on right now. Okay, with that, we will get started with our daf. We have a very interesting daf, a kind of I would say, somewhat not expected way to end our Masechet, with a whole bunch of different comments about how to handle Sifrei Torah. All sorts of rules, which might, you know, might be familiar, might, many of them might not be very familiar to people, so we're going to learn them together, starting from the top of Lamed Bet Amud Aleph. Tanu Rabbanan, Poteach v'ro'e golel u'mevarech v'chozer u'poteach v'kore. Divrei Rabbi Meir. We're going to see a machlok at Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, which, if you remember, since our daf was already a few days ago, you might not remember, but we also ended with a machlok at, um, on the previous daf between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda, to which then we had a, we, Rabbi Zera decided who we were going to paskin like, and then the Gemara asked, why didn't he just say the halacha is like Rabbi Yehuda? He kind of described what the halacha was, and then they said, well, that's because sometimes people switch who said what. We're going to have a very similar thing here. When you open the Torah to make a bracha, so first you open the bracha, you're about to read from the Torah, you go, you open it, you roe, you see exactly what spot we're up to, golel, you close it, okay, you roll it up again, umivarech, and then you make the bracha. Vechozer upotech bekore, after you make the blessing, then you open it up again. So we're going to have to figure out why Rabbi Meir thinks that we do this. This is Divrei Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Poter v'ro'e u'mevarech v'kore. He says, we open it, we look, and then, once we look exactly where the spot is, you make the bracha right then and there. De'amar ula, ah, my time at Rabbi Meir. So what's the reason why Rabbi Meir says you have to close the Torah in order to make the bracha? It seems strange. So he says, Kid ula, de'amar ula, as ula says, Mipne ma amru ha-kore b'torah lo yesayel l'metor geman, so first of all, I want to just say what type of an answer this is. The way the Gemara works here, and it's very typical of the Gemara, they take an answer given in a different situation, and they say that same answer would be applicable here as well. So what's the answer? So the answer is, or what's the issue, the other issue? The other issue is, we learned already from, this is nice because it connects back with things we learned earlier in the Masechet, when they used to read the Torah, they would have a Mator Gaman. This is still done in Yemenite synagogues. Somebody reads a Pasuk and immediately someone else translates it. Okay, translates it into, right, reading the Targum Unkelos. Wouldn't really help most of us. But maybe after learning a lot of Gemara, you'll get better at tar- understanding Targum Unkelos. So, 
they would basically say that the person who reads the Torah is not allowed, not only not allowed to translate the Gemara, the, the Torah, but also can't help the person translating. Let's say the person translating starts fumbling. You can't help them. Okay, you can't say any of the words of the translation if you're the one reading the Torah. Why is that? Well, you're going to find this, I think, a little bit strange. They don't want people to think that the Targum, the translation, was actually written in the Torah. We had this whole thing about, can you translate the Torah? Can you translate the Torah? Remember, and the whole thing was about preserving the text of the Torah and understanding that the text of the Torah is the text of the Torah. If you want to start translating, that's fine, but understand that what you're using is a translation, right? I always say this when, you, when you're learning Gemara and you take the Steinsaltz or the Schattenstein and, and you're using it. Always remember that, right, the, that, that what you're using is a translation. It's not the actual text. They're already taking away, right, some of the, the purity of the text itself. And what they want to keep here is the purity of the Torah. The tra- you don't want anyone to think that maybe the translation was written in the Torah. So therefore, you can't do that. So it comes now here. Okay, that makes sense when it comes to the Targum. The next line is a little bit more strange, which is hachanami. We can then say the same thing, that when you say the bracha, you have to cover the Torah. Why? We don't want anyone to think that the bracha were written inside the Torah. Right? That's already why someone would think that the bracha were written inside the Torah is a very good question. Don't have a great answer to that question. But they say it must be, because I can't think of any other reason why you would cover the Torah when making the bracha, because we don't want people to think that the bracha are written in the Torah. Again, it's this idea of keeping the purity of the text. The text of the Torah is the text of the Torah. Anything else that we do, we, we say bracha, we give the targum, we give the translation. All of that is extra, additional. But that's not the Torah itself. So if you have to, def- you have to say what this stuff is all about, it's really about the sanctity of the Torah and how pure we have to keep the sanctity of the Torah and not to mix it up with anything else. So now, Rabbi Yehuda, why does Rabbi Yehuda think then you can open it? Because he says, He says, I understand that you might confuse and think the Targum maybe was written in the Torah, but nobody's going to think that the blessings were written in the Torah, so there's no concern at all. And Amar Rabbi Zeira, Amar of Matna, I already alluded to the fact that we're going to get to this Psach Halacha. He says, Halacha poter umavarech bechore. You actually don't need to close the Torah. The Lema Halacha ki Rabbi Yehuda. So now the Gemara asks, just like they asked before on Rabbi Zera, why don't we say the Halacha is like Rabbi Yehuda? Why did Rabbi Zera say in words, I hold by whatever Rabbi Yehuda does, but he didn't say very simply, I hold like Rabbi Yehuda. That would have been very simple. The answer is, Mishum da'afche lehu, because some people switch who said what, and therefore we want to make it very clear. So we're going to say, he said it explicitly what the answer is, what the halacha is so that you don't get confused. What do we do halacha lamase? So this is very interesting. We hold like Rabbi Yehuda that you actually don't need to cover it up. However, there's many customs that developed and, and it's quoted la halacha in the halacha books that you're actually either you close your eyes or you look to the right. Some people say you look to the left. There's different opinions and that generally you're not really supposed to look inside the Torah when you're doing the brachot. Basically, even though we hold like Rabbi Yehuda, to be concerned for Rabbi Meir's opinion, where generally the custom is not to actually look at the Torah, look down in the Torah when you're making the bracha. Amar Rabbi Zera, Amar Rav Matna. Since we quoted, we're going to have a lot of these things today where we quoted someone saying something, so we're going to quote something else that he says, and it's obviously somewhat connected. Haluchot v'habimot ein behemishum kedusha. Another thing that typifies our da'ah is that, as usual, we're going to have a lot of Terms that aren't so clear what they mean or explanations that were not so clear what they meant by following statements and many different interpretations. We're going to try to keep it simple today for our seum. But luchot and bimot, there's different uh, interpretations of what they are. Some people say luchot are the margins in the Torah text. Some people say they're you know, on the parchment of the Torah. Some people say that they're boards that the children used in school that they wrote the Torah on. And then the luchot and the bimot. Some people say the bima is the place where we put the Torah. Some people have some other interpretations of it. Ein behem ishum kedusha. They don't have sanctity of a sefer Torah. Some people say they do have sanctity of a beit knesset, like of a shul, which is a lower level of sanctity, but they don't have the higher level sanctity. Amar Rabbi Shvatya, Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Hagolel sefer Torah. We're now going to have a number of statements of Rabbi Shvatya. 
Someone who rolls the Sefer Torah, Tzarich Amidenu Al HaTefech. When you roll the Sefer Torah, you have to roll it so that the center that's right, that as you're rolling it, the, the center has the tefer, the stitching. Because what are we worried about? That's exactly the point, which it could be weak and it could tear. And if it's not on the, on the stitching, then you could actually maybe rip the Sefer Torah where the wording is. So you have to be very careful. Okay, so I'm going to first translate the words. It's very unclear what this means. Rabbi Shvatya says, in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, that if you roll the Sefer Torah, you roll it from the outside and not from the inside. Many, many different interpretations were given to this line. And when you close it, Okay, when you seal it or close it up, you close it from the inside, not from the outside. So when you roll it, you roll it from the outside. When you, when you seal it or close it, you close it from the inside. So what does this mean? It's not so clear what this means. And I'll, like I said, there's many different interpretations. I'm going to go with the Ramah and the Shulchan Aruch. And he explains, if you look in Hilchot Sefer Torah and Or Chayim Kuf Mem Zayin, if you want to open this up at some point, in Seif Dalit, it says exactly word for word in the Shulchan Aruch, HaGolel Sefer Torah Mi Bachutz, Ukeshuma Ad Koma Ad Komi Bifni. Basically cuts out a few words, but he says word for word what it says in the Gemara. And the Ramah who writes his comments on the Shulchan Aruch said, Perush, okay, he basically said, I understand that you probably didn't understand what that meant, so I'm going to explain to you what the Shulchan Aruch meant when he said this. And what he meant is, when a sefer omed lefanav, yaktav neged panav, when the sefer is in front of you, the writing is should be facing you. You should be looking at the writing. And then, v'yatchil liglo mi bachutz, that means you wrap it from the out, you roll it from the outside so that you're facing and you're looking at the text, because the text is what's important. You don't want to be looking at the back side of the Torah. And then, well, when you hadek, when you close it, right, we have these clasps or different kind of straps that go around almost like a belt. When you seal it, you should do it mi bifnim, okay? And then, here I'll actually look if, on the daf at Tosfot. Tosfot says, in Golelomi Bachutz, if you look a few lines down, he says, "Kishi yiftach sefer Torah yetzarich lafchol aktav latira kesher ve'en zederek kavod." If you fasten it on the back side of the Torah, then what's going to happen when you go to open it? You're going to have to put the Torah flat on its back side. That's not going to be an appropriate way of respecting the Torah. So therefore, you do it in a way that the clasp is in the front, facing the wording. That way, you can open it. Okay. So those are the two different methods. Then. Amar Rav Shvati, Amar Rav Yochanan. Another thing he says, Asara shekaru b'Torah hagadol shebahem golel sefer Torah. He says if ten people read from the Torah, which you have to wonder why are ten people reading from the Torah. So some people say what this really means is not ten people reading from the Torah. If there's ten people in shul, then which one do you choose to do galila? Okay, the the rolling. But some people say that it's ten people. It's the seven readers on Shabbat. It's the Chazan. It's the, um, it's the, what is it also? It came, uh, forget, but they came up with a way to get to 10. Okay, so maybe that's it. And actually, it's very relevant, the machloket here, because it means, okay, well, let me read, and then I'll tell you why there's a big ramification of whether you say it's 10 people who actually read from the Torah, or it's 10 people who are in shul when they're reading from the Torah. Hagadol shabahem golel sefer Torah. The most prominent among them does the rolling. Now, does this happen in your shul? Okay, anyone? Not usually, okay? Usually it's not. The one who does galila, often they pick a child to do it, okay? They pick someone who's young and doesn't have a lot of experience, maybe hagba to raise it. They pick someone a little bit more important. First of all, they claim the galila used to be hagba and galila. The person who rolled it did both. Okay, that's number one. Another thought occurred to me now is that maybe after all these warnings about how to do it properly and it's a little bit dangerous, you could possibly tear it on the scene. Maybe they people didn't want to do this job and they therefore said, oh, we're going to pick the most respected person in the community so that people would actually want the job and it would be, as we call it, a kibbut. And that would encourage people to do it. So we'll see why we don't actually do this anymore. But according to the Gemara, it's really Hagadol Shabahen. He rolls the Sefer Torah. And whether you assume it's the, the greatest among the people who read from the Torah, 
Or maybe it means, no, the people read the Torah and we picked somebody else to do glila. There's a big machloket about this among the poskim. Is the, right nowadays, generally, I, unless you tell me otherwise, but generally the person who does glila is not one of the people who read the Torah, which we just use as an opportunity to give it to somebody else. But when, uh, but according to the Gemara, there are some people who think that the Gemara reads as we choose of the people who read the Torah, the one who is the more prominent is the one who gets glila. And then it tells you even more. He gets the reward of everybody. To which the Amar Rabbi Yosho ben Levi is Rabbi Yosho ben Levi said, Here he said it. It must be that's the case. To which the Gemara says, Wait a minute. How could he take the reward of all the people who read the Torah? Here you roll the Torah and you get the reward of everybody. It means he got as much reward as all of them put together got. So you can see here they're clearly encouraging people to do glila, right? It seems like that's one way to look at it. Or they really thought that rolling the Torah was an incredibly big, uh, big job and very important and given to the most important person. Why do I say this? Because, again, this doesn't match the reality. Okay, uh, what I didn't mention is Sephardi Sefer Torahs are very different and how they would read the sugya is a big question because they don't have all this wrapping around and, and other things. Although they do use mitpachot and they, they do have other things, but how you read it would be a good question. But what I wanted to read here is the Mishnah Brura. The Mishnah Brura in Kufmem Zayin, Sif Katan Zayin says, Zehu mi This is the real base halacha that the Golilo is supposed to do all this. V'achshav nahagu shalol ledakdik b'seh. U'mechabdim af l'anashim benoniim. He says, nowadays people don't really do this, and they have regular people do this. Why? It's very interestingly, Mishum Darke Shalom. Okay, we're going to get to Darke Shalom later on in Shas. A very interesting thing, which is in order to prevent fighting between people, right? If you give it to the biggest person in the shul, well, everybody knows what's going to happen. You're going to say, oh, he got it, I didn't get it, she got it, I didn't get it. What, what's going on here, right? So it's very important to keep peace within the shul. So we don't want to start pointing at who do we think is the greatest person and who who not. And therefore, the halacha changed because of that, which is very interesting. And then he points out that not only that, but now we even give it to younger children. So there you see the Mishabur already had the custom that we have, which is that often we give it to younger children. And that's our, okay, so that's this halacha. Moving on. I'm a, okay, if you, now we get to the most strange line of our daf. Okay, Amar Rabbi Shvati, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, because we quoted other things he says, he now says, "Minayin shemishtam shim bebatkol." How do we know that you can listen to a he- to a voice that you hear? Okay, whether it's a heavenly voice or just a voice, we don't know. But if you start hearing voices, you can follow what the voices tell you to do. Okay, now this is very difficult because the Torah says "lo tenachashu." You're not supposed to follow voices. We've seen in the Gemara that we don't follow the batkol. We don't listen to heavenly voices. Famous story of Tanur Rosh Alachnai and other stories we've seen. We don't follow bat calls. So why are we listening to this heavenly voice or whatever kind of voice it is? So the Gemara here says, you can, In Sefer Yeshua, it says, if your ears hear something from behind you, speaking and telling you, then you should, it says, This is the path that you should go. Kita aminu vechita smilu, whether, right, whether you go, you mean or small, basically it sounds like you can follow this voice. So how does that work with Lotan Achashu? All the commentaries really question this. And it seems that they distinguish between this idea of, of, this is like you want to go somewhere and you just need some sort of push to go there. So if you think you hear some voice telling you to do this, you can follow it. But it's not the same as the Torah prohibition of Lotan Achashu. I'm going to leave it at that. It's obviously a little bit more complicated. But we're going to move on. Vahan and Mile, here we're now going to define, well, how do you know that this is a voice that one should follow? So this gets even more strange. If you hear the voice of a man in the city and the voice of a woman in the fields. Now, some people say, okay, you've got to wonder why this is. Why is the man of the voice in the city and the man of the woman in the field? So some people say it's normally the opposite. So it's atypical for you to hear the voice of the women in the fields because the women were more at home in the cities and the men were out in the fields. So if you hear some other strange voice, maybe that's something, some voice that you should basically go follow. Behuda Amal, 
Hain, hain, vuhuda amra, lav, lav. If it tells you yes, yes, or it tells you no, no, you can go follow that voice. Okay, now, the double is coming from the Torah. Often when God calls people, he calls them Avraham, Avraham. Right? We see that many times where names are doubled. Okay, and that maybe is a, is a sign that it comes from God. Again, this is very odd. What this is doing here, the only thing I can really think about is that, to me, this connects with the whole idea of the Megillah and how God's name is hidden in the Megillah. And that many times we say we're waiting for a sign from God, right? We want to know what should we do. We're waiting for a sign from God. And sometimes the idea is that the signs from God are there and it's our job to see them. Just like God in the Megillah is hidden and it's our job to find God in the Megillah and, and see that God was behind everything without it being obvious and and noticeable. So I think that that's an idea here that all of a sudden jumps out at me if you think about the Megillah in general, even though we're really not on the topic of Megillah, but you can't ignore the fact that we're at the end of Masecha Megillah. Okay. Another thing he says, another, again, these are off, awfully interesting statements, I should say. If you read the Torah without the, the sing-song tune, okay, that I understand. Okay, there's laning, there's a tune, that's important. But if you learn your Mishnayot without singing them, Okay, this is a verse in Sefer Yechezkel, which says, I'm going to give them laws that are no good. In other words, this is no good. You have to sing your Torah. Okay, I don't think you really want me singing to you. But that's what it says here, that one should sing Torah. And I just don't have a good voice, so that's why I don't think you want me singing. Um, but the idea is that Torah should be sung and it should be pleasant, right? Music is pleasant to our ears. Um, the Gemara, the Tosfot in Shonei Belo Zimra says, that's how you remember things, right? I remember my kids when they were learning for tests, they always did it with songs. It's a good way to memorize things. So songs are a good way to help you memorize. And remember, Mishnayot were meant to be memorized. So it's an excellent way to remember what you're doing. Okay, next. Matkif Labaya. Abaya says, what are you talking about? If you don't sing that, those are statutes that are not, that are not good. What do you mean? You don't have to sing. So Abai says, Mishum de lo yada levesume kala, mishpatim lo yichyu bahem, karit bay. That's the end of that verse. The end of that verse is, you're going, you're not going to live by these rules, okay? You're, you're going to end up dying. But that's pretty harsh. Ella, so Abai says, it must not be that. Ella kiderav mashar shi adama, shnei tamidei chachamim ayoshvim bi'ir echad, ve'ein nochim ze etze bahalacha, lehem akatuv omer, ve'gam ani natati lehem, chukim lo tovim ve'mishpatim lo yichyu bahem. He says, no, it's talking about Tamidei Chachamim that learn with each other and fight with each other in a bad manner, right? There's a way to have a, a conversation of Torah in a respectful manner and not in a disrespectful manner. And if you learn Torah in a disrespectful manner and disagree with someone in a disrespectful way, that is Chukim Lo Tovim, Umishpatim Lo Yichivim. You're not going to live by your learning. That's not learning that's going to sustain you. Amar Rabbi Parnach, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Kol HaOches Sefer Torah Arom, Nikbar Arom. If you hold a Sefer Torah naked, you will be buried naked. Now, what do we mean by naked here? Again, you could say maybe it's defining the person or maybe it's defining the Sefer Torah. It means that you're touching it without anything in between you and the Sefer Torah. You're touching the raw Sefer Torah. Okay, that then you will be buried naked. So the Gemara says, Arom Salkadatach. What are you talking about? Nobody's buried naked. We always put shrouds on people. And La'ema Nigbar Arom Below Mitzvot. You'll be buried naked of Mitzvot. All your Mitzvot will kind of disappear. To which the Gemara says, I still don't understand that. Below mitzvot, Sakhid What do you mean? You're not going to have... Oh, because you touch the Sefer Torah, everything you did in your whole life disappears? El amar nikbar arom below ota mitzvah. You won't get that mitzvah, which is strange. Obviously, you won't get that mitzvah of giving respect to the Sefer Torah. You didn't do that. This isn't an extra thing. So Tosfat actually says, what it means is if you read the Torah and you touched it while you were reading it, then you lose the mitzvah of having read the Torah. Okay, that... Anything you did with it kind of disappears. Here we're getting the whole generation. He said it from right from Rabbi Yana, the elder, who said it from the Rabbi Yana, the elder of him. Again, respect for a Torah. Again, the reality, it's not so clear to me exactly how this works, but wrap the, 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 the cover of the Torah around the Torah and don't wrap the Torah to fit into the cover. But you, okay, that's the end of Sefer Torah. Now we're going to have our last line for today. First, we quote the Mishnah. If you remember, the Mishnah had listed all the readings you're supposed to do on all the given days. 
And it said, we learn this all from a verse about the holidays that says, Moshe spoke the Moadei Hashem to Bnei Israel. Mitzvatan shukorin kol echad echad bizmanu. This teaches you that the mitzvah is to read about each holiday in its appropriate time, when the holiday is. To which the Gemara brings in a brighter, which is not exactly the same idea. And I want to kind of end with this idea, which is Tanu Rabbanan. Moshe tikem lem Yisrael, shu sho'alim v'dorshim b'inyano shal yom. The rabbis instituted that when it's a holiday, you should ask and learn the halachot of that day. Hilchot Pesach b'Pesach, hilchot atzeret b'atzeret, hilchot chag b'chag. All the holidays should you should learn those holiday those uh, laws on that day. Why does the Masechet end with this, and what does this have to do with Megillah, and why did Megillah end up with right? We asked this question at the beginning. Um, why did Megillah end up with all these chapters about Sefer Torah, about Beit Knesset? So I think there's a bit of a clue at the end of this Masechet, and this might also be why they ended with this chapter in the Gemara, and not the previous. They wanted to end with this idea of reading Bismano. We started with that. Remember, when is the Megillah Nikrate? But you. Aleph, your bet, your gimel, your dalit tefav, right? And then we said, how could it be read in all those days? And then we said, well, it says in the Megillah, bizmanehem, in their appropriate times, and they have multiple appropriate times that it could be read. And therefore, we end with this idea that we read on the holidays, bizmano, and we read on Purim, bizmano. Bizmano there is a little bit different, but it's the same kind of concept. And then what I want to talk about at the very end here is this idea that we've been comparing all along. And we actually notice probably more differences in Kriyat HaTorah and reading the Torah than Kriyat Megillah, right? We saw, let's say, Trey Kale Lo Mishtame. You can't, two people can't read Torah together, but two people can read Megillah, even 10 people can read Megillah at the same time. And we saw these laws, for example, today don't apply to a Megillah. We, we touch a Megillah. We don't have any, we don't need to wear gloves or kind of separate or hold a cloth or something like that when we read the Megillah. It's very different than a Sefer Torah. It doesn't have all these laws. So on the one hand, we're comparing them. On the other hand, they're very different. And I think that one of the ideas here, if we think about what is similar, though, despite all the differences, if we talk about Megillah, we mentioned that Megillah really doesn't appear in the Megillah. The fact that you're supposed to read the Megillah doesn't appear explicitly in the Megillah. Really, what it tells you at the end of the Megillah is you should make these days, days of feasts, and, and celebration, and you should do Mishloch Manot, Matanot Lev Yonim, which got such a teeny mention, a very funny mention in our Masechet, but a very, very small mention. And the whole Masechet, other than the parts about Kriyat Torah, are really all about reading the Megillah, which is not even mentioned explicitly. Why is reading the Megillah so important? And I think that the clue could be found in this last line, which is reading the Torah. We don't always view the reading the Torah as learning Torah, but there's an element of learning in reading the Torah, right? That's what we read every week, and we always talk about Parashat Shavua, and it's a way that we get to learn and engage with the text in a learning kind of way. And when they said here that the mitzvah is to read every portion in its appropriate time, and then they immediately said, well, it's a mitzvah to learn all the halachas, right, which are not necessarily in the Torah readings, but there's this idea that the idea of Torah reading, and then, let's take it to Megillah, is that the rabbis, when they created this holiday of Purim, they wanted to create it with something that was a model that they knew already, which was Kriyat Torah and learning, this learning model, and showing the importance of not just experiencing, there's the experiential aspect, which is the Mishloch Manot and the Suda and all of that, but in addition, add this element of learning. And therefore, the merging of the two is what they wanted, and the Megillah, because it wasn't mentioned, they, needed, they wanted to stress that part, especially the rabbis, who everything for them centered around learning. So I think that that might be an interesting way to look at the idea of reading the Megillah and why the Masechet spent so much time talking about Kriyat Torah because they wanted to say this is the model on which we base Kriyat Megillah. And that's why it ends with this idea of Bismano and Bismanehem to merge the two ideas together. And with that, Hadran alach b'nei uslik ala Masechet Megillah. And now we will say the Hadrans together. Put them up on the screen. Hadran alach mesechet megila vehadra chalan. Daatan alach mesechet megila vedata chalan. Lo neshe minach mesechet megila velo tit neshe minan lo baal mahaden lo baal madate. Hadran alach mesechet megila vehadra chalan. Daatan alach mesechet megila vedata chalan. Lo neshe minach mesechet megila velo tit neshe minan lo baal mahaden velo baal madate. Hadran alach mesechet megila hadra chalan, daatan alach mesechet megila vedaatach chalan, lo nit neshe minach mesechet megila velo tit neshe minan, 
לא בעלמא הדין ולא בעלמא דעתי. יהי רצון מפניך, אדוני אלוהינו ואלוהי אבותינו, שתהא תורתך ומנותינו בעולם הזה, ותהא מנו לעולם הבא. חנינא בר פאפא, רמי בר פאפא, נחמן בר פאפא, אחי בר פאפא, אבא בר פאפא, רחמן בר פאפא, רכיש בר פאפא, סורחר בר פאפא, אדר בר פאפא, דרו בר פאפא. הערב נא אדוני אלוהינו את דברי תורתך בפינו ופיפיות עמך בית ישראל ונהיה אנחנו כולנו צאצאינו וצאצאי עמך בית ישראל כולנו יודעי שמך ולומדי תורתך לשמה. מרווי תחכמני מצוותיך כי לעולם היא לי. יהי ליבי תמים בחוקיך למען לא אבוש לעולם לא אשכח פיקודיך כי בם חי איתני. ברוך אתה אדוני למדי מחוקיך אמן 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 סלע ועד. יהי רצון מפניך, אדוני אלוהי, כשם שעזרתני לסיים מסכת מגילה, כן תעזרני להתחיל מסכתות וספרים אחרים ולסיימם, ללמוד וללמד, לשמור ולעשות ולקיים את כל דברי תלמוד תורתך באהבה. וזכות כל התנאים והאמוראים ותלמידי חכמים יעמוד לנו ולזרענו, שלא תמוש התורה מפינו ומפי זרענו עד עולם. ויתקיים בנו, ותלכך תנחה אותך, ושוכבך תשמור עליך, והקיצותה היא תשיחך. כי בי ירבו ימיך, ויוסיפו לך שנות חיים, אורך ימים בימינה, בשמאלה אושר וכבוד, אדוני עוז לעמו ייתן, אדוני יברך את עמו בשלום. שיר כוח לכולם. It's amazing, כל הכבוד. So exciting to finish another מסכת together. We will read the first line of Masechet Moed Katan. I know many of you already started it, but in case you didn't, here's your intro to the next Masechet. Moed Katan, I actually thought tonight that it really starts off in a very similar way to the way Masechet Megillah ends, which is, Mashkim Beit HaShlachim B'Moed U'Bashvi'it. You're allowed to water a field that needs irrigation on Chal Moed and Bashvi'it, and also in the Shemitah year. Ben Mimayan Shetzav Tchila. I'm not going to get into all the details about how and when and where, but what I'll talk about is the concept of this Mishnah. The concept of this Mishnah is what kind of malacha is forbidden on Cholomoed and what kind of malacha do we allow. And the question is really a question of what, why did the rabbi, and there's a debate about whether one can't do work on Cholomoed by Torah law or it's only rabbinic law. And the question is the rabbis, and if you listen to Dr. Ayala Lipson's Um, intro to me, Moe Katan. If you haven't yet, you should definitely listen. She talks about how what happens in, in Moe Katan is that the rabbis are trying to tell you how you're supposed to feel. They're instituting certain things that you can or can't do to create a certain emotion and a certain uh, feeling for the holiday. And I was thinking it's the exact same thing as Megillah, that they instituted that, this idea of Megillah that I was talking about in order to have an intellectual experience, that sometimes the rabbis institute things because they want you to have a particular experience, a particular way of looking at it. So in that way, Moe Katan starts, in a sense, a little bit similar to the way um, the Megillah, Masecha Megillah ends. With that, we will finish with this section of the, of the uh, Siyum. Thank you for being part of it and for finishing the Masechet with us. Um, before we introduce our next speaker, I just wanted to mention that on Sundays for the next two weeks, if you did miss the first one, Rabbi Nit Leah Sarno is giving an intro to Gemara. And one of the things we don't get into Dafyomi always is all the background and the intro and the, and, um, the basics. Okay, I mentioned them here and there, but this is, of course, geared toward the basics, the Complete Beginner's Guide to Gemara. If you missed it, it's all online and you can still catch it. And it will be continuing for the next two weeks. And after that, I'll be teaching a skills class for four sessions on Tikkun Olam, which is a little bit similar to Darkei Shalom, a little bit different. But um, for Sugyot and Gitin, where there we will actually, hopefully those who took the beginner's course will feel the confidence that you can then enter into Chavruta learning and start getting the basic skills. And those, it's also geared toward intermediate learners to advance your skills. So we're always trying to come up with ways to help people both with Dafyomi and get to all the content, but also how to learn how to learn Gemara.